assume qualities of leadership at every stage of your career. So before I start, I really want to thank, uh, thank the Getty Conservation Institute and the ANAGPIC programs for their generous, generous sponsorship, which has made these events possible. So now getting started, I'm going to read a little of comments about uh, Bob's background. Bob Norris is the executive director for the First Tee of Delaware. The First Tee is a national nonprofit that empowers youth and in part impacts the lives of young people with educational programs throughout access to the game of golf. Bob also is a consultant focused on business transformation and leadership agility. He has over 40 years of experience in the practice of how to develop and deploy continuous improvement, strategy development, organizational change management and adoption, and financial management in both corporate and consulting organizations. Previously, Bob has worked as a senior director for PwC, senior associate leader at Deloitte, and senior principal at various boutique consulting firms. Additionally, he was the senior vice president for AIG and the business improvement director for a multinational chemical and pharmaceutical company. In his over 30 years of consulting, Bob has focused on industries including insurance, banking and credit card operations, telecommunications, and customer service, as well as in the manufacturing and public sector. Recently, Bob has partnered with large museums, such as the Getty Conservation Institute, integrating leadership concepts into their daily work relating to preventive conservation and facility management. He has also worked with the Winter Museum with development strategy development. He has also co-led a three-day leadership seminar for conservators with Sarah Staniforth and Joel Wiggins. Bob has been an executive leadership coach for senior leaders as well as leaders in training. He, his expertise in process improvement and measurement, training, teamwork, organizational assessment, and organizational change management and strategy development. He has an MBA degree concentrating in organizational behavior and an undergraduate degree in accounting. He is a certified and master black belt in continuous improvement and a senior examiner for the Malcolm Aldridge quality, National Quality Award. He lives in Bloomington, Delaware with his wife, Debbie Hestenars. They have two daughters and are very proud grandparents. So please welcome uh, Bob Norris to the podium. One more quick thing, I wanted to note that this session is being videotaped, so at the end there will be a portion with questions and answers. And if you have any questions for Bob, please come to the microphone so we can hear. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. Thanks for uh, ECPN and the leadership team uh, for asking me to come up and present to you all today. Um, as Eve mentioned, that Debbie has an RS, I'm blessed to have her as my life partner and wife. And um, she asked, she's, one of the things that Debbie and I uh, have talked about over the years since we've known each other since high school is, and I said, Debbie, you have to warn me because I, I, I really need, a, I need to have a, a, a fact check every now and then because. I know you love the Beatles, but if Paul, George, and John are in order, but if I fall behind Ringo, uh, I need to let you have let me know. So hopefully you'll have some fun. That was a little kind of a little little love at the end last time, and hopefully you'll have some fun as we as we talk in terms of to serve is to lead, and I added to lead is to serve. And the idea here is, and the whole objective is to provide you in 30 minutes or less, and we'll leave about 10 minutes after the questions. Some key ideas, some key leadership essentials that will help you when you go back to your work and maybe kind of want to assume leadership or if you want to kind of influence those around you, but you don't have authority. So the goal is to kind of give you at least one of an idea that I'll throw out in terms of a list of ideas. Uh, in terms of to help you and to kind of introduce what leadership truly is from my perspective. As Eve has said, I have been doing leadership training for many, many years. Uh, part of my uh, consulting part of my career before I became the executive director of the first team was really kind of introducing change to the organizations. You all have change in your organization? Absolutely. So the natural point of change is resistance to change. A lot of what I've done from a leadership perspective is counsel and work with senior leaders to help lower the resistance to change and help their programs get accepted and adopted. And there's alignment to that. So there's a couple key words you're going to, you're, you're going to hear me say over the, year, over the next 30 minutes. 
One is about alignment, adoption. One is about line of sight. Because a major part of leadership, as you all know, is, is to kind of talk to vision, mission, and values. How many here have heard vision, mission, and values? Raise your hand. Yes, of course, everybody. Some organizations it's really good, some organizations it's not. Some organizations have them these days, some organizations have not changed them for many, many years. Invariably, when I go, when, even when, I, when I, as I am an examiner for the National Walters National Quality Board, and I go and I talk to organizations, and I try to see a line of sight from leadership, strategy, down to the, the lowest levels of the organization, the organization that really gets the importance of vision and values and mission is all about being able to see that line of sight. So if I can go to the lower parts of the organization, to the customer-facing people, to those that are, are, are doing the work kind of to support the organization, if they know vision, mission, and values, and they can connect it to the organization, guess what? Then you have a really solid leadership team who've done their job. Objectives that you see up here, really, as I said, is that one takeaway I want you to have. And once again, feel free to ask questions at the mic, and then if you want, and if, if you don't want to use the mic and come up to me afterwards, feel free to do that. We want to discover also your personal leadership traits. So let's rock and roll. The influential leader, leadership essentials. So what is leadership? Got to start with a basic definition. You can see that quote. No one can whistle a symphony. If it needs someone to direct it, it takes a whole orchestra play it. Anywhere you are in the organization, you can be a leader. Now you hear that, you say it, people, you hear that, and people say that all the time, but I firmly believe that everybody has, inherently in who they are and what they are, leadership qualities, leadership skills, and all you need is that ability to have confidence in yourself and that ability to kind of pick the right situation. Leadership it takes at least four areas, motivating people, influencing people, commanding people, and guiding people. You can, if I would sit there and we were in a class as I was just yesterday afternoon with ECBN um, uh, members, what I would ask is to pick out a leader in each one of these categories and symbolize each one of these categories. I'm not going to do that in this session. We think about who could, who is really good at motivating, who's really good at influencing, both on a personal life basis, but also kind of somebody that's noteworthy in history or forward. Um, somebody that embodies this for me is, in essence, a Lincoln, and he is kind of one of my favorite of, of leaders in terms of what he did in the situation. And that's my point. We are all doing this at different times. So leadership becomes situational in terms of how we do it. So take that context in mind and say, there are some times that you're going to be motivating people. There's some times that you'll have to influence people to get what you want. There's some times, like a disaster preparedness situation, where you'll have to be demanding people to do things. And there'll be some things around guiding people to get them to the right answer. Mentoring people. I could put mentoring up here as well. If you have that ability, you be good strong leader embraces mentoring and drives that home and looks at her or his staff and basically says, I'm, not, I'm also both, I'm a manager, I'm a supervisor, I'm a leader, I'm also a mentor. Especially when from an ECPM standpoint, it's, it, I can't stress enough the need for mentorship. So, as a leader, you have to be aware of multiple different things, from common goals to what roles are needed, and who does what roles, involvement of all members, maintenance of self-esteem of the staff that you have, the team that you have, who is going to make the decisions, how are decisions going to be made, are we going to empower the employees to make decisions, are we going to hold them accountable for that. That's a reoccurring theme when I talk about kind of leadership and serving others, it's all about the empowerment, but empowerment comes with accountability to make it happen. Mutual trust, that's obvious. Respect for differences, absolutely these days, hugely critical. Back when I was uh, a young uh, staff accountant, there was a lack of respect for differences. There now is it's all about respect for differences. How do you handle conflict? How do you handle it constructively? How do you kind of know that in that mentoring role, that 
constructive conflict resolution becomes critical, that constructive criticism, that ability to give advice, to point out errors, and we all fail forward. All these things make up what teams need and what aware, the awareness of a leader to be present in the moment, to be aware of what the team needs is absolutely critical to success of the organization. So what makes a good leader? So if you look at the list above uh, from a recent Yahoo survey, and this is a massive, massive number of people uh, completing the survey online. So you start to see one through eight. Now, people talk about them. Invariably, when they, they talk about, about them having problems with leadership, invariably number one comes up, communications and listening skills. My boss is just not listening to me. Well, how can I get that individual that's important, that, I have, that I'm reporting to in an organization, that has to make the decisions to help improve what I do or help kind of elevate what I do? Some level of reality. How do I have? How do I get her or him to listen to me? Well, absolutely. How we communicate. I'm going to give you some, basically, some communicate tip, communication tips before because it's invariably a key part of all leadership training. Effective leadership skills. I have a bias in training here today, and that bias is, is something that in the '70s, when I locked when I locked into this in the late '70s, it's called servant leadership. It was done by a gentleman in North Carolina back. Robert Greenleaf. Lots of literature out there if you want to read about it. I locked into it. It seemed to fit my profile, fit my personality. And guess what? I've taken those leadership com com comments and concepts and really applied them. Nobody really knew much of certain leadership until the last couple of years. It's now all of a sudden becoming a very way, a strong way for leaders to be uh, uh, to embrace leadership. Especially with culture today, uh, servant leadership. So you'll hear a little bit about servant leadership. If you don't know much about it, um, I highly recommend that you look at it. I think it, I really think, and I feel that it's really an outstanding way to kind of, if you will, embrace and engage your employees. Trust is obviously one flexible and understanding. I, when I also grew up, and also in the time coaching of executives. You have to do it my way, or the highway, no longer applies. So how, do you, how can you be flexible? How can you kind of understand the situation that you're working in and adapt to that, yet still do it in context to the strategy, the alignment, the values, the mission that you have? Collaborative, collaborative work is absolutely key. Um, and you'll hear something about that as, as one of the leadership te tests. No longer can we be isolating ourselves in our organizations. We have to be looking outside the organization for help and support. But we also have to work collaboratively inside the organization. No longer can you sit at your bench and do your work. No longer can you sit at your desk and do your work. Social media, electronics connect us so kind of all the time that you have to think larger than what's in front of you. So the idea of leading in a collaborative work style is also a, a leading trend in, in this field. Intelligence, obviously, is key. And it's not just smart well, intelligence. It's intelligence in what you do. It's a common sense-based intelligence. It's an emotional intelligence in terms of, are you sensitive to others' needs? That's a huge, huge area that is now coming into the mindset of the teams and of, of the young employees that are coming up into the organization. Teamwork skills and practicing good teamwork skills. From doing the basics of every meeting should have an agenda, to having roles and responsibilities known, to having kind of a uh, project plan in terms of doing team skills are all part, part of being a good leader to stress those basic fundamentals of good project and team execution. And the last but not least is even temperament. So even temperament is is so critical not only in times of need or times of emergencies even temperament to say we can solve this i got this we have this let's all collectively get together and solve this problem one of, one of the things that i'm always coaching leaders on is the talent that you have in your organization use it don't ignore it use it 
hire these individuals, you bring these individuals, you have the, this talent, access them and give them a voice. And you come to that from an even temperament. I don't know if you all work with, but I certainly work with bosses that didn't have that even temperament. And basically what happens? We shut down, right? We absolutely shut down. I am not going to say anything because I don't know what's going to happen to me. Do I still have my head or not after I meet with them? So even temperament to be able to kind of calmly figure out the problem solve is makes a good leader as well. So there's a key print, there's key principles here that I want to impart on you in terms of the start of being a good leader. And you all may do all of this, but it's important that you know as a fundamental aspect of what this is all about, it's the be no do kind of concept and structure and and kind of, if you will, con the construct. It's, it's B. You have to believe. You have to have a strong belief in the direction you're heading. You have to have a strong belief in the values you're heading. You have to have a strong belief in the leadership style you want to be. And the only way you can do that is to know yourself. For instance, as I said, servant leadership. We'll get to servant leadership in a second. But there are key elements of this in terms of caring and compassion, in terms of me wanting to make my staff successful, and their success is my success. I'll probably say that a couple more times. But that belief, once I walked into servant leadership, it started to define and started to fit in very well into my personality, very well into kind of my team aspect because I was an athlete for many years, and it felt, and it felt right to me. It was kind of, if you will, as you see, it felt right, and I believed it, and I started to exercise on servant leadership. You all have a different leadership style, you all have different personalities in this room. There will be a things that you will define yourself as a leader. But you have to first start to believe here in the heart, know who you are, what you are, what you value first. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to project that out to your teams. So that's number one. Number two is no. You have to get a feel for what everybody does. The, the manager that comes in and doesn't know what his or her team does, shame on you. You need to get out and work with your team on the bench, find out the pressures they're under, look at their skills, find out what they're doing, and making sure that they know that you care about them. So you have to understand what they do. You have to understand that those pressures that are, that are with them. You have to understand kind of what are roadblocks that are preventing them from accomplishing what they need to accomplish. Do. It is all about those things that I showed as far as good leadership, what makes a good leader. It's implementing, motivating, providing direction, mentoring. It's actually putting those leadership concepts into play. So be, know, and do. Ask yourself personally, how good am I at be? How good am I at know? How good do I do? If you can answer, answer that question, you can score high, you have Fundamentals down. Now let's focus on what, what, what it takes. Some of the key, the key thing about a leader, the only way you can be a leader, truly, yes, you have a title. The only way you can be a leader, by definition, is you have to have followers. People that want to commit to follow who you are, what you stand for, what you believe in. So think about that. Uh, I'm, I have a position. I'm the leader. I can do wonderful things only if you have people who follow you and who are going to enjoy following you or can commit to what you can do, how you are, and who you are. That's why this be, know, do becomes really critical. Surveys say, say people who want to be guided by people they, res they respect, who have a clear sense of direction and mission, who gain respect, they must be ethical and a sense of direction is achieved by conveying a dynamic vision of the future. Once again, if you're a lower part of the organization, what can I do? Well, what you can do is establish that vision, establish that mission for your, your group, however small or large, but make sure that it's aligned to the strategy. Make sure that it's aligned to the strategy. Now, all of a sudden, those people that are in your group can start to see the benefit that they do for the organization making a difference for the organization and ultimately whoever the customers of that organization are, be it the guests of this museum, be it taxpayers if it's if it's an institution, government institution. 
So alignment becomes key to be a leader to get people to follow you. So this servant leadership model, there are 10 components that I have picked out that are absolutely critical to be a servant leader. And they're all basic common sense. That to me is huge because honestly, in a very kind of will self-evaluation mind, I will never be the intellectual leader. I'll never be that kind of, kind of rocket scientist that <coughs> can make it happen, but I know I can motivate people. If I motivate people, and you all, if you can motivate people by using these 10 different areas, and showing and projecting this, it's worked for me, it's worked for others, it can work for you too. So this is my bias. So listen, y'all listen to me, actively listen to me. You may be working on your cell phone a little bit, but that's okay. But are you listening to me or are you picking up what I'm saying? That active listening, being able to repeat back what I hear to make sure that those who are hearing what I'm saying or what they're saying to me, that I'm picking it up. So listening becomes important. Looking, the body language of looking somebody in the eye becomes really important. Usually if I'm in the classroom and not on the podium, I'm really trying to make eye contact with the individuals that, I, that, I, that, I, that I'm working with in the workshop. I'm trying to make eye contact with certainly the people here, but I'm trying to make eye contact with you all back in the back of the room. But that's important. If I can make that kind of contact with you from a body language standpoint, and put my hands out and reach out and grab you and be demonstrative with my hands in different ways, I'm going to get your attention. You're going to start to actively listen. It's all part of that kind of listening. Of course, empathy these days is absolutely critical. Sometimes I can be over empathetic. I'm happy to be over empathetic. But it's almost like I, I, I want to feel that pain, I want to basically, and I want to try to find an experience in my lifetime that be able, that's able to relate to my employees, that I can say, I know I have been where you have been. I want to help you as a leader. I want to make you successful. Care and compassion is I'm going to spend time with my team. A servant leader spends time with their team, and they go forward with focusing on on um, uh, making sure that they get to understand their employees. They walk in the shoes of their employees. They um, focus in on an understanding as much as you can without prying too much in terms of who they are from a personality of interests and likes and trying to kind of mesh all that fabric together into a pro profile that I can use as a leader. Be aware of what's around you is, is number four. Try to focus in on on those things that are around you, not only inside your group, but outside your group. One of the really good parts of the leaders that I've had, and some of the, the, the executive leaders that I've talked about, is they've been very aware. They're not solely focused on their group. They're very aware of what goes around that group. We're going to talk about influence at the end of this, this short presentation, in terms of being able to influence and give you some kind of ideas for influencing. It's really influencing without authority. I'm not talking about persuasion. I'm not talking about twisting arms. It's how can I get people to believe that my idea is actually their idea? And how can I get them to understand that we're working together, we can, we can do more. And there's things that I can trade, things that I know that I can trade to you, and you in turn trade that back to me. That level of influence is kind of a key tool. Conceptualization is all about looking forward and kind of conceptualizing what that future is. That goes with foresight. What is that future? What is that strategy? How can I make sure alignment and my, my team, my staff, is, is aligned to that and can adopt that strategy and see that strategy and what they do and how important it is? Stewardship is easy. It's, we have assets. We have a mission. We have the organization's mission that we have to care for. How do I, as a leader, care for that? What do I have to do to ensure there's sustainability, there's stewardship into it? Am I leading in the short run, making short-term decisions, or am I making a combination of short-term decisions and long-term decisions? Commitment to grow people, this is at the heart of servant leadership. Once again, I said, for me, the key element is my success is dependent upon the success of the individuals. Your success as a leader will be dependent if you embrace certain leadership. Your success is dependent upon the skills, the attitude, the output of those individuals that are working for you. 
pure and simple. So I have to do everything in my power as a servant leader to be able to kind of provide them the capabilities. I go through and, and I've recommended and, and leaders have gone through a skills assessment, a competency assessment. So I have a profile, not of the individ not only the individual, but I have a skills assessment that I'm working on and I'm encouraging, I'm trying to find the money or the time, even if it's volunteer time, to train in my staff and the important skills that they need. Not only the hard skills, the technical skills that we all have in this room, but it's really the soft skills. Invariably they're going to come out and have lots of experience with the technical side of things, but they're not going to have our soft skills. And so one of the things that I encourage those that are in the, are, are in the audience from an ECPN, young emerging conservators, to kind of identify where you think your skill gap is, and then seek that training to support that. If you're managing people and you've been in the field for a while and you've attained that supervisor, that manager, that leader perspective, ask yourself, do my employees, do my, does my team have the right skills to do the job? Once again, not on technical skills, which is the focus of and I certainly know the world conservation is, it is those critical technical skills. But do they have the soft skills to go forward? The last one is building community. One of the things that I said to the EPCA group last night or yesterday afternoon was the fact that it's all about community, it's all about networking, it's all about and ECPM is, has a mission to network with all young conservators out there, all emerging conservators. All the new in the field or want to kind of learn about the field. So guess what? It's this community that's critical. Think about your organization. How many times do you go outside the organization and go on a quote field trip to another part of the organization to share what you do and what they do? Probably not much. Because that when I invariably bring that idea up with my clients when I was in consulting with it, oh, we don't have time to do. Well, guess what? Those areas that are inputting into you and those areas that receive what you do, you need to engage them. You need to share. I know the time is tight, but that investment of time by looking outside and building community inside the organization is absolutely critical. So that's servant leadership. I want you to think about that and see, see how you can do it. But know that on basic leader, uh, uh, level, as a leader, you inspire others to strive for excellence. You ensure operating environment is safe. You teach, mentor, and provide guidance. You put the welfare of the group ahead of your own self-interest. This is completely different than the model I grew up with, where the leader was doing everything for themselves. Once again, the switchover, and if you will, the trend in leadership is now to just do this. Put the welfare of the group as self-interest. Selfless is not being hands-off. You have to know your team. I do spend a lot of my team, my, a lot of my time as a leader, and I have advised and coached executives in terms of how well do you know your team? It's the second time I've said that. How well do you know your team? Not only from what they can do technically, but who they are as a person. That investment of time will play a dividends in the future, a significant dividends in the future. Once again, you also have to talk about what is, I use the word greatness here, but what is the future for us? Where do we go? What do we do? How can we improve what we do? Focusing on that and instill some idea generation, some creativity, have some fun with it. I've been doing this for 25 years, I've been doing the same thing. Do it somewhere, some way differently than we've done it before. That motivating kind of opening up to ideas starts to empower individuals to start to think, start to contribute, and start to be part of the group. So it's all about helping others succeed. Now, collaborative leadership is it an art of science? It's both. This matrix tells you that it can be from a, if I go to the top or top left hand, uh, left hand corner for you, uh, it can be supporting. In terms of your, your, your style is to support, low directive, provide the tools, provide the guidance, but let them do what they need to do to be successful. But you're there to support, make sure they have the right tools, skills, and competencies necessary to do it. If I go across to your right, coaching, that's also a critical part of being a collaborative leader. What are you doing from a coaching standpoint? What, how much of your time is allocated per week to coach your staff and your team? 
you're if you're a emerging con uh, conservator, how much of your time looking across your team can you to leadership skills and help coach and mentor if you have a unique skill, unique talent that fits into the job that can help the team improve? Delegate. I like to use the word empowerment these days. The delegation and empowerment, the difference behind that is, is in delegating on a really dramatic point, directing you to do something that I think I, I can do. Empowering is to say, I'm giving you that ability to do it, make decisions, make sure that it produces an outcome, but with accountability. The, the idea about empowerment in this kind of delegating box in the lower left-hand corner is all about the fact is that it's really more about empowerment these days. But empowerment has gone wild in a lot of organizations. Just go ahead and do it. Yeah, just do it. And then when it comes back, you realize, oh, that's not exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. But to empower me, boss, to do what I need to do. Well, what I didn't say, and what I should say, is empowerment comes with responsibility to understand what is value. It does come with accountability for performance. So you will be held accountable for getting the same thing, and you have to understand that what you're doing, and you have to look at the value you're delivering to the organization. As a leader, I can delegate, I can empower, but I have to be able to explain the, as a collaborative leader, there's, there's more than just delegate. It comes with accountability and the ability to produce an outcome that is aligned to help the group and the organization I'm with. And the last one is directing, and it is this kind of command, kind of, but you're, and it, it's, it's really what, in some cases you have to direct as a collaborative leader, but what you want to do is to ask for input prior to decision making. I am, the buck stops with me as a leader, but you have to ask for input. As soon as you ask for input prior to you making that decision, you've done a wonderful job of bringing your team into the problem, the situation, the task or activity that they have to do, they've been able to contribute. Ultimately, the decision is yours in a directive way of collaborating <coughs> because you're, you're in that leadership position. But if you bring them in, you ask them for input, you, you listen to them, actively listening, guess what? They feel part of the effort to make it happen. And if there's one thing I don't see enough is I don't see that ability to ask for input prior to decision making. I learned it early on in my career is let go of the authority. You're not letting go of the authority of, uh, you're not the ultimate authority to make the decision, but what you're doing is you're spreading the authority out to get the input to make that, this, that right decision. It's far better than you thinking about what the right decision is. So the art science. I'm going to talk about what's in the blue box, and that is the new notion of power. It's a new normal. I'm absolutely convinced if I look at all the research that I do, how I work on it, it is this, this shared power. Your team should feel the sense of power that they have to help drive the success of the organization. This collaborative style of working helps you share that power. It gets people involved. It gets people involved in decision making. Once again, it stops at you. You have to make that decision as a leader. But that involvement is that sharing of that power, sharing of information as part of that power. And knowing when to be able to share and when not becomes critical. Once again, it's all about enabling success. There are leadership qualities and skills that help drive influence, like assessing the environment, creating clarity, sharing power and influence. I talked a lot about the self-reflection. When I coach leaders, I say, so how much time do you spend reflecting on your team, reflecting on who you are, reflecting, the answer comes back, well, Bob, if I'm lucky if I have to be truthful. That self-reflection, I spend maybe 5% of my time on my day, maybe once a week. And my comment is, well, let's think about who you are, what you are, that be, no, do aspect that I was talking about earlier, and use that as a construct to help you self-reflect. How am I doing in each one of those? Because if I'm getting those right, my probability of being a great leader goes up significantly. What am I doing to build trust? What am I doing to develop people? 
once again, you start to see a theme coming forward with great leadership. It's about the people. It's how I work with the people. It's how I mentor the people. It's how I focus in on who they are and what they are. So collaborative leaders involves getting everybody together, making sure they're aligned to the vision, they adopt the direction you're heading and the mission you're heading, and they're committed to spend the time to produce the output that meet whoever your customer is, your guest, the next department, whoever the customer they're, they're, they are committed to produce that high quality output to meet that customer. So leadership communication, there's a couple other factors we'll get to here before I open up the question is. So Bob, I keep a get it. So tell me about communication because if I go around the room and I do a quick survey, I say, what's the number one problem that you have that really stops and is a barrier for you in terms of doing your job successfully? You're going to tell me. Somewhere in that actually top three is communications. So I'm working with leaders, we spend a lot of time talking about communications, we talk about communication planning, we go through messaging, in terms of deciding what the messaging, how best to deliver those messages, how best to reinforce those messages. And we spend a lot of time focused in on making sure that what you communicate is being received, being understood, and being applied. And how do you do that? How do you do that well if you've gone through the planning, gone through the thought process of the key messaging that you have to do, how do you make that real? So these tips that you see in the circle are those things that I've worked with in terms of leaders. And you can do all these. Know your team. I've said that now four times. <laughs> so obviously that, that's very important to me. Do you really know your team? Because if you know your team, you're start going to be learning how to communicate. Role model what you do. If you decide to hide behind emails all the time, they'll come back at you with emails all the time. Is that effective way of communication? Maybe or maybe not. Depends on the situation. But once again, role model. If you want them to, to, to make face-to-face -face connections with you, get off their, the, the, their, their mobile phone and texting you or emailing you, drop in on them. Sit down, go talk to them, the old-fashioned way. You have to role model the behavior. If you role model behavior and you ask for that return, you'll get that return. Find your style. We've been talking a little bit about style. I've given servant leadership as a style. I've talked about collaborative leadership. But the big part of you, know your style, know what works for you. Not everybody's going to be the same, but know who you are and what works for you. But keep those key principles in mind in terms of what your style is. Find a weapon. That's a highly technical term. Those that were in my class learn what the kind of definition of weapon is. is it? Who here knows what the definition of weapon is? Raise your hands. A couple that were in the class. It's really highly technical. It may change your life once you know. So as a leader, you're communicating. It's what's in it for me. W-I-I-F-M, weapon. So what's in it for me? As a leader, when you're starting to communicate it, is you have to answer that question, especially with your staff. We're going to do this. We're going to do this right. And we're going to have fun doing it, right? Well, I haven't asked the question, but what's in it for you if we do it right? What is right? What's the definition of ready? What's the definition of right? I have to, I have to, if I know my team, I, I know my style, I better listen to my employees to see what they, what is, what is, what is important to them. If you don't understand what's important for them, what's in it for me? All the messaging in the world not going to sink in. Admit mistakes. We all make mistakes. Sometimes I run into leaders and say, well, I can't say that. I can't. I'm vulnerable if I make a mistake. There's a lot of power in making mistakes and saying how you turn that into a learning session, how you turn that into, we need to fail forward. You're hearing that phrase all the time. Don't delay, especially today, in terms of social media, uh, in terms of how we find out how 20, this 24-7 news cycle or that we tend to live in every day or as close as our cell phones. Um, don't delay. If you think about it, think through it, but quickly get messaging out. Face to face, I mentioned that before, huge, be clear and concise. It's really important, especially today, is that you think about how you break a messaging. This is probably, if you will, an area I still have to work on because I'm not very concise. You're experiencing a little bit of that today. Um, but the idea being is, is you have to be 
clear and concise. How do I say this in 15 months or less? That's not necessarily a standard, but how do I say this in less number of words? Get to the point. We all are kind of rushing to do things. We all don't feel we have the time to do. But we all are in that mindset of quickly turning things around. So if I go on a long-winded story, I'm going to lose you, especially if it's an important point. So be clear, be concise, be precise. All these things as leaders will help you communicate. And it's the most important thing, one of the most important things I, I, I learned as I was, I was leading a group of communication experts. I had inherited that group as a training group as well as my business improvement group. And my supervisor of communications came up to me and said, Bob, this is communication rule three. This is back in the 1980s, or 90s, 1990s. He said, she said, you know what? I, I repeat things three times at least. First time you hear me, but they may not necessarily be paying that close attention, so they don't really know. The second time, I'm driving for an understanding. I understand is what I want to get out of that. The third time is when I say it, it's now starting to integrate into who they are and they start to know it more. So messages that I want you to hear, I want to repeat at least three times. Because at that point, I have a pretty good problem. There's a pretty good probability and I have a higher level of assurance that you've actually heard what I've had to say. That you actually can put into play what I've had to say. So think about this communication rule three. You can do it three different ways, but the key message is it has to be repeated three. So let's talk for the next couple minutes on the art of diplomacy. This is what was the kind of theme of the workshop yesterday. And you can see the definitions up there. Diplomacy is the art of letting someone else have your way, or you're convincing them your idea is their idea. And Dwight Eisenhower's leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because she wants to do it. And so it's all about influencing. And so what we're going to talk about is a model around influencing. But first, this leadership comes from position relationships and the personal piece of it. And all those positions come in play. And I can influence if I want of the organization, but I also get influenced by the bottom of the organization. And this model that I'll show you kind of briefly kind of do a drive-by on, you can use that. One of the absolute keys of the model is relationships. You cannot influence if you don't have relationships. You don't have relationships with the team you work with, with the organization outside, but you have to build relationships. You have to network. You have to spend that part of your day building those relationships and caring for those relationships and nurturing those relationships. And then it's the personal ability to kind of balance it all and be able to kind of give something of yourself, whatever your currencies are, and you'll see that word in a second, to somebody else. So influence is the definition, the way I take what influence is the ability to change, direct, or affect the behaviors of others without ordering or threatening them. It's something you actively do, you don't passively do it. Make a difference and enlist support to accomplish your goals and objectives, and also those who you are working with to help them accomplish their goals and objectives. It focuses influence on, if you remember one thing around influence, it's all about this law of reciprocity. Wow, that reciprocity seems like a very legal term. When I first read it 10 years ago, I'm going, what do you mean reciprocity? But really, if you break it down, reciprocity is I give you something. I should expect something back in return. That central concept of influence, if I give you something, you should expect to give something back to me in return. This is the trading that goes on. I'm going to give you something that's going to benefit. I want something back that's going to benefit. So influence is all about trades, if you really break it down to a transactional basis. What do I have in my set of currencies that I can use, that I can provide to you that you can then make it and you can be successful and then you know there's something that I want from you. It could be expertise, it could be advice, it could be information, it could be looking into your network, it could be office space, whatever it is, you have something to trade. What we never think about is what do we have to trade, what do we have to exchange. I said relationships matter, we'll talk about that in a second. It requires to know what you're doing, know yourself, know what you do, know what you can trade. And 
By the way, everybody in this room is far more influential than who you think you are. You can apply this regardless of where you're in your organization and who you are in your organization. The model is like this. So if you start from the left and go, go forward, you have to identify who your allies are, and in turn, when you're identifying who your allies are, focus in on who those people are going to be those resistors. I won't say opponents, I won't say enemies, but who will resist, and who do I have to kind of convince to help me do what I need to do, but who do I need to identify who's not my ally or who my resistor? If I have that profile, I now know might, for those resistors, I might have to trade something more valuable than somebody that I have an ally. So that analysis becomes first. The second is, what do I want? What is my goal in trying to influence people? What do I need to help? What are my goals in terms of what I need to do? If I'm working on a large project and I need resources, what do I have to do to trade to get extra resources to come in? And it might be supporting the brand, it might be consultation, it might be information, it might be office space. Whatever I can do, I need to figure out that goal, and then all of a sudden start to kind of think about what I can trade. The third one I think is the most important one. You can only, it's kind of negotiations, but you only can influence if I've actually been in the shoes and I've walked in the shoes of the, people, the person that I'm going to trade with. So if I know their constraints, if I know their pressures, if I know their issues, I sense what they what they truly need. Because I've been there, I've walked in, I've talked to them, I've interviewed, guess what? I now have an ability to make that trade. You go through and identify relevant currencies. What's a currency? What you see here is a currency. So something that's inspirational related, those things that I can work on helping you strive for excellence, provide training, I can kind of, kind of create and give you best practices of how I drive success, personal related. I can kind of get you involved. I can give you notoriety. I can kind of provide growth opportunities for you. For that, I want something else. I can be position related. I can provide you recognition or visibility in the field of your choice. I can give you and, and give you resources to help you do a white paper that will get you the notoriety that you need to be able to give you what you you want in terms of having the power to, 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 to do more of what you do. It could be task related in terms of new resources, learning, training, organizational support, the ability to rapidly respond, but they might be task related, being able to help you do some project management related work because projects are lagging by providing you a resource on a part-time basis that's on my staff that has that project and then relationship based. It might be the fact is that I can connect you to somebody in my network that's really going to make a difference for what your team does. Can you come, have them come in and give you all a training session that really can improve the skills of your organization. So who do I have in my network that I can lend that you can make a difference for your group? And in turn, I might need something back in the future. So currencies become really important to be able to figure out and do a self-assessment of what is the value that I want to trade. The last one is dealing with relationships, building relationships, and it's what I said earlier. It's having those relationships that you can only trade the people into your world, but make sure there's an opportunity to get to know what they want, what they do. All this happens in this very structured way, influence happens. Influence the ability to change, direct, or affect behaviors of others without ordering or threatening them. Because it's a law of reciprocity, you have that ability to trade. So, building strong relationships, tips for success. I'll only highlight a couple of these because I want to open up for questions in just a second. Know your colleagues, know your team strengths. That helps build anticipate concerns that emanate from the fear of loss um, in terms of losing something organizationally. Seek opportunities number seven that identifies differences and determines ways to resolve differences. Everybody loves to solve problems. Could position it as an opportunity for growth or a problem we can solve together. Now all of a sudden you have a commitment and now you can figure out what you can trade. By having that relationship and joining the rest of the team and solving the problem we have at hand 
or the issue we have at hand, or the concern we have at hand, or how we can drive strategy makes a whole difference. And the last one is really important, especially in these days. In fact, when I was downstairs with a, with a plenary session for a few minutes, the presenter was speaking about facts and data and how to use facts and data to make decisions. And so intent is to bring facts and data to the discussion to support your needs. People that may not want to trade with you, if they start to see the facts and data, that will start to convince them. So, what I really want to do is I really want to end right here and just kind of reinforce these, these points. So, always a great leader once again. Maintain and demonstrate strong conviction for his or her principles and core values. Be no do. It will help communicate a clear winning vision. Whatever that vision is, that, that hope, that hope, dreams, and aspirations of the future. Build trust through transparency. We talked last yesterday a lot about transparency. How important it is to the emerging conservators is to have that transparency. I see that as I'm working with younger workers. I see that as I'm working with younger kids at the first day of Delaware. Be visible. Don't hide in your office or by your workstation. Get out. Walk around. Understand who they are. Believe in that service concept. My success is only dependent upon the success of my team. Convince rather than control. Influence. Use that influencing model of that. Thing. And build commitment. The key, you're never going to be successful unless you have a really high level of commitment from your team. You, they know you care about that. And the last one is I have to always be learning what I'm doing. So that's it in a nutshell. There's a checklist at the end um, that you can use. I'd be happy to send this presentation to you. Well, what questions do you have? I'll certainly take from about seven to ten minutes of questions if you have questions. And if you have a question, as Eve said, come up to the microphone because we're recording it. And I'd, I'd love to kind of uh, get that recorded, get your questions. Come on down. Thanks. Hi, I'm Helen Alton, and I'm now the director of a small museum, so I'm doing conservation and directing a small museum. And one of the things that I found really difficult, I, I, my heritage is Greek, it's kind of volatile, is that staying connected. Yes, yes, yeah, and volatile. I purposely got a house away from everybody else in town because I knew my house would be the loud one. But this calm part is really hard for me. And so do you have any hints or, or ideas for that? I can be overly calm, so I'm not Greek. Um, so, um, <laughs> but but I, it, it, it's the kind of way you would normally say, take a breath, think before you speak, and kind of that stuff. All right. Um, I always go back and I work with leaders and supervisors and managers, is really internalize the plan, the mission, and the vision. And if you can do that, that kind of takes it all out. And I also have a I also work with leaders to get get have, make sure that they're confident that any problem can be solved. It's not the perfect solution, but it can be solved. It can be the first step to solving a succession of regression. So if you have that confidence that the problem can be solved, short success breeds success, small successes add up to a much larger success. I've seen that countless number of times. So take a breath, relax. Think about what I'm about ready to say. Think about that vision, mission, value in terms of what I'm about ready to say. Is it going to address the need, that I, the message that I want to communicate? I don't know. I hope that helped you. I, I think so. I mean, there's times when things come from a field. Right. And that's when you're like, yeah. well, that's when I react loudly. Okay. Yeah. Think, think first. That's okay. the basic comment. <laughs> what other questions? Yes. Click the side of it. Um, as a team leader, one of the things that frustrates me is having to repeat myself numerous times. Um, so your concept of saying things three times really struck me. So do you have a sense of a uh, period of time that that is most effective? Less so than others, perhaps? I'll give you my, my consulting uh, uh, answer. It depends. All right. So um, it really, so if it, it, it is situational, but usually, usually if it can, you, 
you can space it out um, a day or two if it's depending on the message. If it's something that has to be done within a short period of time, then I would say um, really do it quickly, three times, all right? You have to allow time for them, the, pe the people who are receiving your messages, to process that, right? So I can't give it all in five minutes, but I, if, if it has to be thought of and done quickly, I may send that message out within the next three hours, once an hour at that point. Usually, though, it's going to be, it's usually going to be, first message goes out maybe a couple days later, and then maybe a day after that to reinforce the message. That third message becomes that reinforcer. I've heard countless times when, they, when you say it the third time, Oh, I guess Bob's serious. Go figure on that one. <laughs> so, but it would be that the timing would be based on emergency uh, and a focus in on, on how quickly you want a strategic message. You, you could do it three times, but it could be weeks apart. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Next question. Thanks for that great talk. Um, I think that a lot of into that in my prior career, and I felt like I learned everything through failing. I was wondering if you had any um, advice for people who have to teach themselves to be good managers on the job and aren't given management training per se. That's the first part. And the second part is, how do you get feedback from the people who report to you in an institution or a company where there aren't formalized strategies? Right. Well, thanks. Both questions. Um, so, so how do you how do you kind of learn from your mistakes is what I heard. Well, learning from your mistakes, I keep a log, typically. I go forward, if I make a mistake, I'm usually recording it down, or I'm looking at it, or I'm playing it back in my mind after I realize that it's a mistake, saying, what can I do better at that point in time? And if it's, a, if it's something that I think I need to remember, that, that goes down on a piece of paper, and this is my log. So, failing forward and making mistakes are always good. I don't know why we kind of think that mistakes are bad. They're only bad if we decide not to learn from them, what we could do better the next time. So, I'm constantly asking that question. What can I do better next time? How can I refine? How can I do this next time? Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is about, about how do I get leadership training? How do I look at books, articles, for sure, I would take a look at who in your organization that you think are good representatives, good role models to leaders, and if possible, I'd schedule a 15-minute meeting with them and ask, and do it over a wide variety of people, and they'll give you nuggets. And that, when you do get the opportunity to do training or listen to somebody who knows leadership or listen to somebody who knows how to, the soft skills, how to communicate, you have a frame of reference. There are, I really have ran into, run into very few people that I've ever talked to that I've gone out to talk to and say, and ask a question. So, why do you think you're, I see you as a good leader. Why do I think, why do you, why, why am I seeing that in you? Can you, can you kind of tell me why, what you do is just maybe normal day activity. But this is, this is what, this is why I need you to tell me and indicate, and I can learn from that. I think they'll be hugely appreciative of that. So, all right. Last question. One more last question. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, this is really interesting to me, for both from a perspective of sort of like a middle, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, a lot of us manage people below us and also our management people above us, right? And um, so this is actually really helpful also in thinking about how my management functions or doesn't function and why. Um, and so I wanted to to maybe flip that around a little bit and, and ask you about that. The, uh, the one thing you said about anticipating concerns that emanate from fear. And yep. fear is, is sort of a big motivator, both coming from below and from, right. and from above. And I wonder what are some ways that you can sort of handle that if, you know, the, the micromanaging coming from above is out of fear and the you know, feeling of, of not being, you know, appreciated is coming out of fear loss. Can we talk about that? So yeah, just a couple ideas real quick. Um, one is is 
so it, fear is, is a multiple, there's a multiple reasons why you have fear, right? It might, if it's skill related, is do that self-assessment and figure out where you're deficient in terms of what you think you need to do your job correctly, your immediate job and also the next job, and where do you need to enhance your skills. I also be open with my supervisor, and I know that takes a lot of, kind of, if you will, confidence in who you are, but I would be open in certain fears around lack of skills necessary to do, do the job. If you have a fear of, of interaction with people, force yourself to go out and talk to the talk to individuals. Much like I said about the quality of, of go out and talk. It doesn't have to be network. Find out more. Um, that helps mitigate the fear because you start to know relationships. You start to know who might that go-to person might be. I, mean, I guess I was more asking about um, anticipating other people's fears. Oh, okay. Sorry, um, and sort of realizing that the reason people may be behaving in a particular way or not not going along with a plan or not um, collaborating is out of fear and how to manage that and how to manage fears other people. I'm sorry I missed that, no. that point. Okay. No. Um, so so here is, is people people have a fear because what they they, they they perceive they don't know what they don't know. And therefore the idea is, is, is maybe what you want to do is you want to over communicate. You want to reinforce what you communicate is everything you, you communicate, you want to tie to that's what's important to you, what's important to your department, what's important to your organization, and what's important to, once again, the, the greater whole, the stakeholders, the guests, and try to get them to think that what they're doing aligns to those goals and really work with them. Once they realize that what they're doing is important to achieve success in terms of making the objectives, meeting the objectives, meeting the requirements of the stakeholders, meeting your requirements as a supervisor, that fear starts to go down. And then you can start to build the confidence by giving that proverbial pat on the back when they do something that meets your expectations. And a lot of times we don't do that reinforcement either. And the more you get that kind of nice when something happens, good happens and you pat, pat them on the back, simply as that, they'll start to respond and say, good, I'm being successful. I have that confidence. Fear goes down a little bit. And I know what's happening in the organization, transparency. And guess what? I can feel that I don't have to be afraid anymore. I can do this job. I can I can make a difference for those key parts of the organization. So thank you all. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening to me. and thanks for Bob again for giving this really great um, lecture and as, you said, as we said earlier we are videotaping it and we'll be sharing, the, sharing this information to the larger community. Um, so I hope everyone has a great rest of the conference and just a quick note if we have any current or new ECPN officers if we could meet over here in the corner for just a few minutes that would be great. Thanks everyone.